Order. Order. Can members please resume their seats? I call on the Honourable Murray McCulley to make his valedictory statement. Mr. Speaker, on the day that I stepped down as Minister of Foreign Affairs, I received an email from a person that had been in my class at school remarking that it was a wonderful thing that someone could come from Arapahui Primary School and Dargaville High School and go on to serve in the New Zealand Parliament and as New Zealand's Foreign Minister. In the small farming community in which I grew up, the notion of a university education for less than stellar students like myself was regarded as fanciful and any idea of being elected to the parliament absurd. So as I come to the end of a 30-year term in this parliament, including a lengthy period as a minister of the crown, it's very hard to convey how incredibly fortunate I feel to have had the opportunities that have come my way. We'd lost the East Coast base seat for the previous three elections before I won it in 1987 with a princely majority of 311 votes. I leave Parliament having achieved a majority of 15,000. Today I want to record my enormous appreciation to the people of East Coast Bays for the confidence and support given to me over 10 elections and for the great honour and privilege of serving, serving as the member for East Coast Bays for 30 years. I give my sincere thanks to the hard-working East Coast Bays electorate team who over the years made it possible for me to win and then consolidate a previously marginal seat. Many of them are here today. Many of them have worked for me throughout those 30 years, and I'm truly grateful to them. I thank the many staff members and officials who have kept me in business and the close friends and family who have supported me. I want to extend my best wishes to Prime Minister Bill English, Deputy Prime Minister Paula Bennett, and the about-to-be former colleagues of mine New Zealand today is in better shape than virtually any country of our type in the world. Occasionally in the past, this country has got some runs on the board, but then lost its focus. You have a unique opportunity to build on a tremendous base, and you have my best wishes. When Morris Williamson and I were first elected to this parliament, it was a very different place, especially prior to the introduction of MMP in 1996. The combination of the need to be personally present to cast a vote and the interminable hours of urgency made this a much more intimate and sociable place. Cast iron discipline was required from the whips, with any absence requiring a pair from the other side. Back in the late 1980s, Morris Williamson, Winston Peters, Ross Morant and I determined that it would be logistically possible to depart towards the end of question time, attend the North Harbour Wellington rugby match at Athletic Park and return before the end of the general debate with no risk of a vote being called or our absence being noted. <laughs> Whether it was the result of a leak or the obvious difficulty Mr Peters had with the notion of remaining inconspicuous, <laughs> we, uh, we returned to find a very angry chief whip who instituted formal disciplinary proceedings and required us to sit through an hour of carefully choreographed speeches about loyalty, teamwork and commitment at the following caucus. The election of the Bolger government in 1990, followed by the mother of all budgets, seared some harsh political messages into our hides. Having been elected with 48% of the vote in 1990, less than 12 months later, some polls were placing us as low as 19%. It was in this grim climate in October 1991 that I received an early morning call from the Prime Minister's senior private secretary to advise that the Prime Minister wanted to see me. Convinced that this was to be yet another of the disciplinary discussions that were then a regular feature of my parliamentary timetable, I not very politely declined. Eventually, the uh, senior private secretary convinced me that it would be very much in my interest to get my useless carcass up to the Prime Minister's office right now. So uh, Jim Bolger informed me bluntly he was making me Minister of Customs, but that would not make me very busy, and that he decided, despite our political predicament, he was going to win the next election, that I was going to help him, and that we would discuss it on a later occasion. We never did discuss it later, but I did find myself fairly quickly immersed in the political management machinery of the place, a role I came to play for many years. I acquired a great respect for Jim Bolger, developed an excellent working relationship with him, and gained valuable experience in dealing with the intractable political challenges at the business end of the government. 
In both government and opposition, right through until 2008, I was involved in one way or another under five leaders in the deeply unglamorous, even more unpopular, and extraordinarily difficult area of political management. About this period of my career, in which I am told I acquired the nickname the Black Prince, a good number of very colourful, mostly unflattering things have been written and said by political opponents and media commentators alike, for which I am sure they are now all deeply remorseful. <laughs> <laughs> I take this opportunity today of thanking them all for their vigorous efforts to enhance my notoriety. They have made me appear very much more effective than I really have been, and certainly much more interesting. <laughs> It was during this period that I ran a weekly blog, Macaulay.co, which was widely read for its intellectual rigour and dispassionate analysis of important political affairs. <laughs> An option for the future, perhaps, if nothing else works out. In 2008, the decision was made by John Key, looking towards the election later that year, that I was to, rem to, to move seriously uh, into the area of foreign policy. Members will recall that the right honourable, now benighted former Prime Minister had a wonderful capacity for lofty Shakespearean prose. In early 2008, addressing me in such terms, he said, my little friend, there is one portfolio where those guys can hand me my ass, and that's foreign policy. I want you to make sure they don't. <laughs> Never before or since has the Office of Minister of Foreign Affairs been so graciously bestowed. <laughs> I think most people who come into this place bring an ambition to, at some stage, play a serious role in a government that they can be truly proud of. In that respect, I regard myself as among the truly fortunate. For eight years, I had the enormous privilege of serving as Minister of Foreign Affairs under New Zealand's greatest Prime Minister of modern times, and of serving as a member of what he called his kitchen cabinet. As I've said on many occasions, in any government, the real foreign minister is always the prime minister. Regardless of geographical location, time zone, or any other considerations, prime ministers and foreign ministers must always be on the same page. To be otherwise is to confuse other governments and international agencies and the vast bureaucracies they retain to analyse every word and nuance, not to mention providing fodder, troublemaking political opponents and commentators. I'm pleased to, pleased to say that in eight years there was not one occasion on which there was daylight between John Key and myself. But much more important was the fact that while former Prime Minister Key quickly demonstrated a com complete mastery of international relations at the highest level, he also bestowed the huge level of trust and confidence in his foreign minister that is critical to making that role effective in its own right. These were an important eight years for New Zealand's role in the world. We managed, after 30 long years, to bring about a normalisation of New Zealand's relationship with the United States while maintaining our nuclear-free legislation and remaining outside of ANZUS. Our relationship was, with China was taken to a new level, with exports multiplying by 500 per cent, requiring careful management of a dynamic and complex diplomatic relationship, as well as one or two private sector challenges along the way. We made major progress with other non-traditional relationships in ASEAN, Latin America and the Gulf states. We managed to break through a long-standing blockage in the relationship with the European Union. And I'm especially proud of the way in which we stepped up to deal with our role and responsibility, responsibilities in the Pacific. New Zealand's campaign for election to the UN Security Council in 2014 was unlike any other diplomatic challenge. You see, foreign ministries from all nations have this wonderful capacity to record every meeting as a diplomatic success. But the problem with the UN Security Council election is that one day the numbers go up on a board in New York and the numbers do not lie. The fact that three quarters of the countries in the world voted for New Zealand on the first ballot, leaving heavyweights, Spain and Turkey to fight out the subsequent ballots, says something that is both totally objective and massively positive about our standing in world affairs. I'm extremely proud of the way that New Zealand conducted itself during our two two-year term on the Security Council. We were diligent, fair-minded, consistent, and prepared to call out poor conduct wherever we saw it, even from our friends. I take this opportunity to thank the many hard-working and talented foreign affairs staff who over eight and a half years supported and collaborated with me 
in places all around the globe. Mr Speaker, I also served for many years as Minister of Sport and more briefly as Minister for the Americas Cup in 1999 and Minister for the Rugby World Cup in 2011. The hosting of the Americas Cup in 1999 involved close collaboration with Sir Peter Blake and his team. Sir Peter's habitual question, will it make the boat go faster, was the greatest possible lesson on focus and a question I was to ask myself many times subsequently when trying to decide which fights were worth having. The winches and whiners were out in force before that event. New Zealanders weren't going to be interested in a rich man's sport. All the cafes and restaurants in the Viaduct Basin would go broke as soon as the event was over, and it was all for, therefore a waste of public money and so on. Of course, New Zealanders embraced the event in droves. The hospitality sector in the Viaduct Basin seemed to be just keeping its head above water last time I checked. And of course, the economic and profile benefits to New Zealand were huge. The same will be the case in 2021. It's my sincere hope that rather than pandering to the whingers and whiners, both Auckland and central government authorities will recognise the huge opportunity that is coming our way and invest wisely and strategically in maximising the undoubted benefits. The Rugby World Cup 2011 was as complex as it was huge. It was one of the great thrills of my time in politics to be given the opportunity to play a role in something so large that gave so much pleasure to so many New Zealanders and banked so much economic benefit along the way. It also gave me an opportunity to work alongside some highly talented and very committed New Zealanders, many of whom remain my close friends today. I hope those responsible are thinking carefully about our next bid to host this event, because surely we must. There is um, one outstanding Rugby World Cup matter that I do want to touch on briefly. In the lead-up to the event, I had occasion to host a dinner for all of the members of the International Rugby Board. Because these were official guests of the New Zealand Government, internal affairs were supposed to have arranged payment of the account, but for some reason best known to themselves had not. So to avoid any embarrassment at the end of the evening, the bill was quietly charged to my office credit card. Even though we were reimbursed the next day, the subsequent release of my credit card receipts containing five bottles of Atarangi Pinot Noir at $185 a bottle <laughs> attracted an unhealthy, and it would be fair to say universally negative interest from the nation's <laughs> media. <laughs> to make matters significantly worse, for weeks afterwards, every time I attended a public occasion addressed by the then Prime Minister, he would draw attention to my presence and to my expensive taste in Pinot Noir. <laughs> it is a sad comment on the state of investigative journalism in this country that not one media outlet such, asks such blindingly obvious questions as, does the Minister for the Rugby World Cup drink Pinot Noir? Did the Prime Minister attend this dinner? Does the Prime Minister drink Pinot Noir? <laughs> now, <laughs> Now, I can no longer recall the answers to any of these questions. <laughs> but I do recall clearly that I lamented the very poor state of our investigative media at the time. Of course, I was to uh, enjoy my own career as an international athlete while in Parliament as a founder member with Trevor Mallard and Damien O'Connor of the parliamentary rugby team. Our first, and it's just the right honourable Prime Minister as well. Our, um, our first coach... John Hart wrote into his All Blacks coaching job on the strength of our success. <laughs> his successor, Richie Guy, neatly summed up my prowess when planning one of our Rugby World Cup campaigns when he said, we can win this competition if we use our speed and skill out in the backs. McCulley, you're playing in the forwards. <laughs> <laughs> this figure in uh, 2009, we started to put in place some changes to both the structure and funding of high performance sport with the goal of making New Zealand on a per capita basis one of the top sporting nations in the world. Too many New Zealanders fail to understand the huge benefits our top athletes bring to our brand and profile in a country which produces and exports food. And using our world class athletes as role models, we have a much greater chance of motivating our young people to play sport and live healthier lives. The decision to give high performance sport its own identity recognised that being world class requires a level of focus and resourcing that is different. We decided to focus, focus resources at that level in the sports where we had a competitive advantage, 
creating a hothouse environment for our top athletes, coaching and staff. In both 2012 and 2016 Olympics, our targets were exceeded, but the real test comes in 2020, when the true benefits of this program will flow through. Provided we stay on track, we'll be able to look back on this as a time, uh, of, as, as a critical formative period in our evolution as one of the world's most successful Olympic nations. Mr Speaker, when the uh, Prime Minister farewelled me from the Cabinet back in May with some uncharacteristically generous remarks, he said that on his research I'd served for longer as a Minister in national governments than anyone other than the late Sir Brian Tallboys. I'd never thought about that statistic, but I went away and checked, and I think the Prime Minister was probably correct. With the indulgence of the House, I wanted to offer, therefore, one or two thoughts as I depart this institution. Uh, <laughs> first, some personal advice. Always keep an open mind about people. When some financial whiz kid gets, who gets elected in your neighbouring electorate irritates the management and you're asked to take him out behind the woodshed for a chat, always leave room for the possibility he might end up being your boss for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> And when some overconfident young woman marches into your electorate office, interviews you, and then instructs you to hire her on the spot, before you tell her to get lost, always leave room for the possibility she might end up being your Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, we hear a great deal about how technology is changing and will continue to change our lives, but we think too little about how New Zealand international interests have changed and will continue to change and about the need to configure our institutions and policies so that they reflect our future interests rather than our past. I grew up in a New Zealand that saw itself as an offshore farm for Great Britain. When the UK joined Europe, we thought we were the unluckiest people in the world, and senior ministers lobbied for years to maintain access to the European markets that took the bulk of our goods. Today, we are one of the truly lucky countries, camped on the rim of the Asia-Pacific region, that will be the powerhouse of world economic growth for as far ahead as we can see. Today, our exports to China are roughly equal to our exports to Australia, traditionally our largest market. But in the next five or six years, our trade with China will be 50% bigger than with any other country. And like any sensible business that does not want to be too dependent upon one customer, we'll be trying to balance that growth with new markets in Asia, the Gulf States and Africa, we have been slow to adapt from a world where we can do business inside our comfort zone with people who speak the same language, have similar history, values and systems of government to one in which a substantial part of our business is with countries who do not. But the next decade or two will see an overwhelming proportion of our trade conducted with nations that are outside that traditional comfort zone. The same is true in relation to our security and defence where the simple alliance arrangements that defined our interests most of last century have given way to an independent foreign policy, a complex and evolving series of regional dialogues and a backdrop of major shifts in international power structures. Yet statistics for the study of foreign languages in this country remain truly dismal, and even important foreign policy issues are denied media space by editors besotted with the eating habits of reality TV stars their medical ailments, wardrobe malfunctions and revolving love interests. Increasingly, the pursuit of this country's economic and security interests will take us outside the comfort zone that history has bequeathed us, requiring a much greater investment of our time, our interest and our skill. Mr Speaker, those who have worked with me will know that I am not a great fan of multilateral institutions, but we must persevere with bodies like the United Nations, not because they are good, but because they will get a great deal worse if countries like New Zealand do not play their part. Good international rules and effective international institutions are important for countries like ours. The alternative is to live in a world where the big guys always win and the little guys always lose. But New Zealand needs to remain a forceful advocate for UN reform. Last year, the international community spent 16 billion US providing humanitarian support for victims of conflict and another nine billion on UN keeping operations. The world's capacity to create human misery through conflict now greatly exceeds its capacity to prevent or resolve it, 
for its willingness to meet the growing humanitarian cost. And that simply has to change. Mr Speaker, I've previously described our work in the Pacific and my time as Foreign Minister is both the most challenging and satisfying part of the job. We're a small player in international affairs, but we're a large and important player in the Pacific. And we are making a difference. New Zealand leadership has been the key to bringing over $2 billion to projects that are shifting the region from its heavy dependence on fossil fuels for electricity to renewable energy with huge environmental and economic benefits. Many islands that were 100% dependent on expensive diesel for electricity generation are now 100% powered by renewables. In the fishery sector, we've made bold progress in helping the region move its largest economic asset, a $3 billion a year tuna fishery, towards sustainable management and towards achieving a significantly greater return for its owners. And we're playing an important role in the growing success story that is Pacific, the Pacific tourism industry, again creating sustainable economic benefits from the region's natural resources. I greatly value the many friendships I've been fortunate to make around the Pacific, and my retirement plans include a continuing involvement in the region. Mr Speaker, the uh, great temptation in this institution is to simply go along for the ride, to spend three years getting elected for another three. I came here 30 years ago to make a difference. This is a tough place, and I've spent the greater part of those 30 years at the tougher end of it. I've tried to get things done, and sometimes that hasn't made it easy for colleagues, friends, and family. But I could never really see the point in being here if I wasn't going to move the furniture around a bit. Thank you for putting up with me for so long. It has been a hell of a ride. Honourable Members, I call on the Honourable Morris Williamson to make his valedictory statement. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker it's uh, the hardest speech that I'm ever going to make.